Hello everyone and welcome to the latest in our series of CVAA webinars supported by the wonderful people of the Community Media Training Organisation. This evening's topic, your guide to contributing to the National Features and Documentary Series. Um, the NFDS, as it's known because we love acronyms in this sector, gives new and emerging community radio producers the opportunity to make a radio feature for national distribution receive mentoring from experienced producers and be paid for their work. All you need to enter is a great idea. And along with that idea, we'll be discussing sort of the storytelling and technical aspects that will help you along. Uh, learning about the application process and selection criteria, great tips on what makes a great story for radio and how to pitch your story idea. Uh, our presenters this evening, include Geordie Caputo from the CMTO, who should be well known to all of you guys. That's the Community Media Training Organisation, cmto.org.au if you want to find out more. And Andrew McClellan from the Community Radio Network, who I know to be in attendance this evening because I can see him peering over the barrier, looking at me, judging me with his eyes. Um, just a quick little bit of housekeeping before we get it all started. Um, upcoming webinars include on the 29th of March, creating cash reserves, then on the 24th of April, entering the CBAA awards. Uh, it'll probably be a similar one to this webinar in that the applications for the awards will open close to the date of the webinar and we will go through that whole process for how you can get involved. Um, now, I believe the first person who will be joining us to talk this evening is Andrew. Um, Andrew, your microphone is on. Can I get a quick check one, two from you? Check one, two. How's that, Danny? That is loud and clear, baby. Uh, I'm going to make you the presenter. You should get a notification in just a second saying that you're the man and then we should be seeing what's on your screen before hitting yes on that. Please minimise any windows that may be potentially incriminating. Uh, we're also going to be joined this evening by a couple of individuals who were involved in uh, last year's NFDS, Sarah Martin from Radio Adelaide and Juan Guerrero from Northwest FM. Uh, they're going to answer a Danny. few questions. Oh, share your screen, Geordie. Oh, yes, right. please. No worries. Andrew's actually going to be speaking to my PowerPoint. Excellent. Yes, please. And you should be the new presenter. Okay, okay you've okay. lost me. I'm still, still live. We're still live, baby. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. Can you uh, see I, the screen, Andrew? I absolutely can. We're all good to okay. go. Uh, hi, everybody. My name's Andrew. I am uh, the operations coordinator of the Community Radio Network. Uh, we're based here at the CBAA. Uh, the Community Radio Network has been going for quite some years. If you haven't uh, heard of it before, just a little bit of background. Um, we are essentially a national satellite service uh, that aggregates and redistributes community radio content from all over Australia. Each week we actually have 400, around 400 independent instances of programming that we distribute each week and uh, uh, including uh, news and a lot of talks and music programming. Uh, but we do have our special projects including CRN segments which you may have heard of as well and of course this, the National Features and Documentary Series. Um, so I just wanted to run through a couple of uh, key points about what the National Features and Documentary Series is. Uh, you've probably already had a good read or uh, on the website or listened to a couple of the previous years. Essentially, the National Features and Documentary Series uh, it's uh, an initiative which gets in uh, a series of producers such as yourselves who uh, are looking to create um, some kind of a feature. As Danny said, the, the line is all you need is an idea and uh, through the, the careful uh, training of the community media training organization and uh, your mentors and uh, feedback from uh, other people such as myself based here at the community radio network uh, we get your feature ready for national distribution and airplay uh, so uh, this is the 2017 edition it's been going since 2014 uh, it's all thanks I should uh, thank once 
again, as Danny just uh, did earlier, thank the Community Broadcasting Foundation for who this is possible. Um, we would encourage you, if you haven't already, to go and check out the previous series uh, and hear what has already been produced in the past. It may what your what your appetites. It may help define your idea or uh, or uh, create an idea if uh, you you haven't got an idea just yet. Uh, as as it says there, all you need is an idea, and the CT, CMTO will mentor it to make a uh, make it into a reality. Um, we should qualify that um, it, throughout the application process. There are a couple of questions about your technical capacity uh, as a producer and the amount of experience that you do have. Um, it, it's open for everyone uh, to apply, of course, and uh, the. The feasibility of you carrying out what you what you said you've, uh, you're planning to do or what you'd like to investigate and make a feature out of in relation to the amount of technical capacity and experience that you have is something that's factored in, uh, but we'll go over that soon. Um, the other thing uh, that is quite clear uh, is that it is quite an undertaking. Uh, it's a minimum of three hours per week, roughly. Uh, that that will probably ramp up as you're finishing the feature off. Uh, like any kind of school assignment, we'd like to think that you get started uh, nice and early and uh, plod along and uh, keep up with the training tasks. If you're successful in the course, uh, falling behind those tasks, that's, that makes a, a, a much more difficult job uh, finishing off what is uh, really a, a, a fantastic uh, piece of radio that you could be working on and uh, we want to see it shine. It's in our interest, if, especially as we're distributing and working with you, we want to see this uh, shine as best as possible and to see you produce some of your best work to date. Uh, it's important to keep in mind since such demands are placed on you that this is a paid initiative so you will be paid for your work. Uh, probably always worthwhile to keep in mind when you, uh, if you find yourself up at 2am trying to edit a file the night before. Geordie, can we go over to the next, uh, the next slide there? I want to run through uh, some of the selection criteria that goes into uh, the application adjudication process. Uh, it's uh, really just four points. The thoroughness of planning that you can demonstrate in your application. Things that are looked for here, who you're interviewing, how you've thought about uh, the piece of radio that you're pulling together. Uh, how you understand the capacity uh, of yourself as a producer, uh, as, as someone of, uh, you know, uh, some kind of technical background or experience, uh, how much you're looking to put into this piece and uh, how much you're actually going to get out, so how salient it is. The originality of your idea or story, uh, I mean, this kind of gets uh, a bit tricky. There's always kind of going to be some overlaps, but uh, not something that's just supplanted um, uh, and replanted from out elsewhere, uh, I suppose. Uh, the potential for creative use of sound. We're not looking exclusively for the most uh, creative sounding applications. This is all in relation to, you know, what you're actually looking to put into the piece and uh, uh, some uh, features and some documentaries will have a greater capacity for creative use of sound than others. Others probably suit quite, I guess, uh, subtle or, or kind of rudimentary uh, uh, uses of interviewing and editing style, uh, but uh, that's uh, something that's also looked at in the application in regards to the idea that you're putting forward. And of course, suitability for national broadcast and distribution, that's really where uh, myself and the Community Radio Network comes into place. Uh, this is something that's been distributed to uh, community broadcasters all over Australia and possibly, possibly even beyond. Um, we want to be sure that we're speaking to a national audience. This isn't just a piece that's appearing in your local area. Uh, if you're talking about local uh, sites or, or um, environments, it needs to be put into a national context for a national audience. I think that's uh, about it. Uh, there'll be time for questions at the end, but if we have a look at the application there, thanks, Geordie, you'll be able to have a look at at this afterwards. It kind of, uh, you'll see everything I discussed there is kind of covered in the application. Uh, you've got your uh, criteria and select, uh, sorry, selection criteria uh, there again. Uh, if you have any questions about this, of course, let us know. Um, 
you will note if you haven't uh, seen this already that it does have an option for Oh, sorry, I should just stop there. As Geordie's kind of pointing out there, that's where we're looking for a bit of information about your experience technically uh, when it comes to editing and working with audio. Geordie, if we just go a bit further down, um, you'll see that there's an option here to upload a piece of audio you've recorded and edited. What we're looking for here is a, a good example of how you've worked with uh, audio in the past and where you are uh, technically as a producer, but even it, it might uh, be a real shining piece of audio that you've worked on. It could just be a simple interview that you've uh, just edited down for local broadcast. So whatever you have there, don't, don't let that daunt you too much. We want, want to just get an idea of uh, where you are as a producer when you get your application in. And uh, I think that's it from me, uh, pretty much Geordie, so I might uh, turn it over to you now. Awesome, thank you very much for that, Andrew. Uh, now, Geordie, you appear to have muted yourself. I have indeed, I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks very much, Andrew. I think that you, you kind of covered everything really well there and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of how you'd actually prepare that application. Um, uh, but I believe Danny now is going to take the floor and have a chat to some of our former participants who hopefully are online. Danny, are they? That is uh, Sarah from Radio Adelaide. That would be Sarah Martin is online and hopefully she's just been given an invitation. Hey, you can hopefully be seeing on your screens at the moment. Sarah Martin on webcam. Welcome to our webinar, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for attending. Um, uh, now... I've got a few questions for you. Hopefully you can share your knowledge with all of our other attendees here this evening. Having completed your piece for 2016, what would you have said to yourself at the start of that project, now having the knowledge of having completed it? There's a couple of things. Um, I guess one would have been probably to listen to more features. So for me, to just expand my listenership, you know, from what I was regularly hearing into other areas, just to find out, I guess, to pay more attention to how audio works. So listening to those sound beds and, you know, the how music works within pieces and stuff like that, you know, just to more for a sense of what I find really appealing when I'm listening to any kind of a piece. Um, and I guess the other thing would have been to know the limits of my subject <laughs> a little <laughs> bit more um, because you do end up with so much stuff and particularly I was reporting on GMOs and, I mean, it's a minefield. There's so many different ways to approach that subject that, I, you know, if I'd kind of decided on my limitations up front, I may have saved myself some time. But then again, I may not have investigated the bits that I ended up using. So I don't know whether that would have been an advantage or a disadvantage. Okay, so you say you sort of uh, wish you'd listened to more. What were you listening to before you did your piece that influenced your work? Um, a, a lot of sort of current affairs based reporting and a lot of talks. Uh, conversational type of um, pieces. So I, and a little bit of things like look, Radio Lab, for example, I was, I was starting to listen to that, but I think I've expanded my sort of podcast listening a lot more now and there are, there are different um, structures and things that I'd probably have perhaps thought about using if I'd explored them further up front, but yeah, at the time that's the kind of sort of productions that I was listening to. Um, Andrew mentioned before that I think sort of a lot of participants do sort of treat it as it's a school assignment as in sort of taking it easy at the start and then cramming on the last night before you have everything due. Um, would you do things differently? <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you do things differently the second time around? Um, yeah, I mean, I was doing the weekly tasks as they came through, which was really useful because Essentially, what we get provided with each week was was quite substantial. So there, to dig into that and really learn from it, I think it was important to keep up with that. Um, I kind of, part of me, I mean, 
we were in an odd situation at the station I come from at Radio Adelaide because we were moving stations. Yep. So part of me probably would have kind of committed earlier to my interviews and got some of that stuff on tape, you know, um, earlier on in the piece than I did. But there were a couple of other factors, I guess, at play. So I ended up with my raw content a bit later than I probably ideally would have liked to because then the pressure was on when it came to editing and really working out exactly how to make the story work. Oh, well, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty after all. Um, what, did oh, you, yeah. <laughs> what did you find to be the most valuable piece of advice that you received from your mentors throughout the project? Oh, um, it was it, it's the kind of kill your darlings theory. You know, it's it's being tough on yourself. So listening to your content and being really clear on what the good stuff is, and even though there's some other stuff that's okay that you'd like to use. Um, being being tough essentially because otherwise you revisit pieces of material time and time again trying to work out what the nuances are between a good piece and a great piece of audio um, and that can be quite time consuming and the other was to limit the extent I mean I had already covered quite a few other issues about my topic than included in the final piece and I guess my mentor gave me permission to kind of reflect on that within the piece and say, hey, there's so many other ways I could have attacked this subject, but this is an insight and essentially a starting point to, to get the discussion happening. So understanding if you've got a big topic that you don't actually need to do at all. Great. I think that can be one of the hard things with audio editing is the actual editing, cutting it away. Yeah, it, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, I I had a fairly good ex sort of solid base to start on from in regard to editing skills. So getting my sound right and things like that, I was quite confident with. It was more the um, yeah identifying the things that were going to make the narrative work really strongly. Okay, yeah, because it's sort of a, you've got to have skills in both story uh, storytelling and audio editing. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent, Sarah. Thank you so much for uh, joining us here this evening. Any final bits of advice before I let you go? Oh, look, just I guess for all of you that are considering doing the program, it does feel a little daunting at times, um, but you get a lot of support. So this this community training, community CMTO, <laughs> I'm going to say it that way, CMTAA, that you got so much support. Um, and use the use the Moodle, use the sort of opportunity to use the forums to talk to other people and you know everybody's kind of in that same situation and I've, I've had the luck of talking with all of the participants or most of them at least after the program and all of us felt that that was really important and it was nice to know there were other people out there but as far as the whole program goes it feels like a big commitment and it is but you get so much value out of it as far as being a content maker and understanding a, just that little bit better about how to make great radio. Excellent. All right, then, Sarah, I'll turn your camera off now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. And, of course, Sarah's piece is available uh, via the uh, uh, CBAA website and various other channels. Um, now, I am not seeing one in our list of guests at the moment. Juan, if you are there and you signed up on a name other than your own, uh, please make yourself known in the instant message box. Otherwise, I might just be throwing it back to you, Geordie. Yeah, no problem. Um, that was fantastic to hear from Sarah and um, get that insight into her uh, sort of, you know, reflections on how she went with the process. Her piece is a really amazing piece, so... Um, Definitely check it out. Food for Thought is what it's called, um, and it's a really interesting exploration. I think, too, when Sarah kind of came along, she had this really interesting kind of idea that we thought was really cool, but it took a while for us to get to the point where 
where we kind of knew exactly what it was going to all be about. So, you know, it's the idea that's got to catch our attention, which is sort of what um, I'm going to start talking about now. I just wanted to, before I kind of go into the into depth and how to plan your um, pitch, I thought I might just explain a little bit about how the mentoring and uh, training process works. Um, as we have been mentioning, you do come to um, Sydney for a face-to-face -face workshop and that's sort of a weekend where you get to really meet with some of the mentors and workshop your ideas and also get some skills um, around a few like particular areas. It's uh, in particular the idea of um, storytelling as opposed to some of the other production or radio that you might have might have done in the past and it's also about looking at some of the kind of high-end editing that you might be doing in a piece like this. So really looking at creative use of sound but also um, complex use of sound as well. Um, so that's the face-to-face -face weekend and then we take you on a journey and as Sarah mentioned there is a Moodle which is an online classroom and you enter that classroom every week um, and we do have webinars along the way as well. So um, you enter that classroom and there's activities for you to do which are very much tied to progressing your story along. So for instance the first day, the first um, week will involve you writing um, a synopsis essentially of the entire um, piece that you're going to make and getting feedback on that from a mentor. And then the following week we'll be actually um, probably uploading some audio so that we can give you, we can actually give you some feedback on that audio. And on it goes. So you're actually creating your piece throughout the mentoring and training process. And that's why Sarah said it's really important to kind of jump in there every week, dig into all the information and also um, keep to the deadlines that we sort of set as much as possible. So we'll go into any, any other questions around that um, soon but what I thought well, the main object of this evening was to start thinking about um, the kind of ideas that you might have that will actually make it through the process because I think we got around 40 um, to 50 applications last year and um, that we could only take eight people out of that. Uh, so there is, um, I guess, a whittling down of all of those pieces. So the stronger your pitches essentially, um, the better chance you have of getting through. So I've just put up on the screen there the previous winners um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about each one in a moment but talking about what makes a really good story, um, some of the, the points on the screen there are what we are kind of looking for. So these might be worthwhile you having as a checklist for the story that you want to create and obviously this is looking at you know kind of the, the final piece that it's focused, that it has an intimate sound because that's really what we're going for in radio, um, that there is an element of sound design because we want you to extend yourselves in this competition. It's it's different to what you would normally do or what you might be used to doing in your, um, in your work in a community radio station. We do want you to take listeners on a journey and there should be some sort of narrative um, or dramatic dramatic arc throughout the story. It's about engaging people, we want the piece to have rhythm and we we often talk about the dramatic arc in, in that there's a question that's posed at the beginning of our documentary and it might not be as um, obvious as that but it's an idea that there's a question in the listener's head when they first start listening to it and by the end they're really satisfied that they've kind of learnt something or they've discovered something new or they've had a personal like experience, um, perhaps they've been moved by a story. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about curiosity satisfied that at the end of the story they feel like our listener feels like they've got something from it. Um, so I just noticed that Juan's just entered the room, Danny. Um, do you want to just check in with him and see if he's good to speak? Ah, excellent. Thank you so much, Geordie. Juan, are you hearing me? I am just going to turn your microphone on. Juan, are you there? Yes. Excellent. Yes, mate. I can hear you. Oh, great stuff, mate. I'm just going to turn your webcam on. That's not the sentence I get to say very often, but I'm very happy to say that in this instance. <laughs> And there you are. How are you going, mate? Good, good. Uh, thank you so much. I'm getting all emotional, Danny, from seeing it, seeing the participants. Are you? <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. So nice. 
Hi, Juan. Hello. I'll turn my mic off now. <laughs> well, there you go. That um, should be motivation for anyone to get involved, even uh, besides putting together a great piece of audio. The, the camaraderie that is the hallmark of community radio. Uh, Juan, I'm going to hit you with the questions that I hit Sarah from Radio Adelaide with. Um, having completed your piece in 2016, if you could go back in time, what would you say to yourself at the start of the project? Uh, don't make up um, phantoms in your own mind about your abilities. <laughs> um, do you want to sort of elaborate that on that? Is that from a storytelling perspective, from a production technical perspective? It's lack of confidence, yeah. Okay. Um, what was the, what did you feel was the sort of radio or podcast that influenced your work? Uh, podcast. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well. Um, sorry. Go on. Uh, what influenced? Oh yes. Um, what influenced my work was uh, I, I heard a uh, a radio piece on. Uh, biohacking the year previously on ABC radio, oh. yeah. So okay. That that yeah, and so all of a sudden, I re it was more of a reality in Australia, and uh, it had to do with the uh, community bio lab in Sydney. And uh, once I heard that on on the radio, then uh, I was determined um, to. Uh, explore the subject and the people who um, who made that happen here in Melbourne. Oh, fantastic, mate! Um, Andrew brought up before that uh, it's very possible that um, contributors to the NFDS uh, sort of do treat their workflow a bit like a school assignment, in that it's sort of you don't do much for the first bit, but then you do a whole bunch there towards the end. How, how did you find that whole thing? Were you sort of cramming towards the end? Um, the editing, yes. Not so much the interviews and uh, the sound effects, and those sort of things. I, I pretty much did uh, toward m very early on in the first part of the uh, assignment. So, so you were you very much a, a chef who had too many ingredients. Uh, I had a long interview to cut down. Yeah. A lot sets of interviews um, and to try and juggle to fit it in within I had two hours and forty minutes so oh wow I had to cut that yeah so I had to cut that down to twenty eight minutes and what would you do differently the second time around would you just sort of not go into it with so much raw content or what, what would you do I would not in I would not record in a laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because there's like Bunsen burners and stuff going on in the background? That's about as much as I there know were about laboratories. Uh, well, it was in a maker's space in uh, Brunswick here. There's a maker space. So there was all sorts of sounds happening um, at random times, which made it difficult, yeah. Excellent. And what did you feel was the most important bit of advice that you received throughout this process? Um, and that would be from your mentors. Oh, I remember when we went to Sydney and uh, uh, when we all got together and we had the, um, uh, you know, the, the, fo the highly focused uh, groups on equipment and then on how to start a story. I think how to, how to start a story, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to start it. That was my, I had material, but I didn't know how to start it. And uh, Jordana and and uh, Sharon were crucial in helping me launch the story, and I'm forever grateful for that. That was the that for me that was the hardest part at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, excellent. And what and uh, any last bits of advice uh, for anyone looking to take part in 2017 that you'd like to impart before I let you go? That's fantastic. You learned so many skills. I'm I'm using it now uh, in. in um, in radio, a lot of skills that I wasn't using before, and drawing and doing interviews and other things, and uh, editing especially, and uh, it just opens up so many doors. 
don't be afraid to walk through those doors. There is, uh, there is pain, <laughs> but yeah. But if you if if you um, take heart, then um, whatever you think those fear, phantom fears are, they dissolve every time you cross uh, solve a problem. You just feel elated, and uh, you just want to keep moving on, and it's terrific. It, I guarantee I. Could not recommend it more. Excellent, Juan. Thank you so much for that, mate. I'll uh, turn your camera off now so you can uh, just take your pants off or whatever it is you're going to do. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, please say good day to everyone there at uh, Northwest FM, Gene and Bob and Chris and the rest of the gang. Yes. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, that was so good to hear from Juan. And, yeah, I think it's really cool that he talked about the sort of journey that he went on through this process because, um, yeah, it's, it is definitely a journey for all of the participants who are involved. You, you really are extending the skills that you currently um, have and learning whole new, new ways to approach radio. Um, shall I move on, Danny? I had my mic turned off just then, and yes, please do. Okay, great. Well, it's so good that Juan and Sarah could join us. Um, I'm just going to spend the next uh, little while um, talking a little bit about the pitch that you're going to create, and then we'll open up for some questions. Um, so if you've never heard of the idea of a pitch before, really it's um, selling your idea for want of a better um, kind of term. It's, you might have a really great idea and in your head and in your kind of experience of it, you think it's really good and it deserves to be told. But the whole point of um, putting together a pitch is so that you can convince somebody else that, um, that that story needs to be made. And in this case, that's particularly important because uh, your initial pitch that you put into that application form, which we looked at earlier, is what will be used to by the by a, a judging panel um, to determine whether your idea will make it through to the next to the level where you're actually going to start making the story. So that initial sort of pitch that you put together needs to inspire, entice, and excite the executive producers, um, which is you know usually what we call the the people at that level, to take the story on and share it with an audience. They need to see that it has potential for an audience to enjoy it. The other important part about your pitch is that it's not just about the idea, it's also about you. Um, now this project is really about trying to skill you up and give you um, the confidence and skills to create this kind of work, but we still want to know that you have certain skills to actually get it up off the ground. And they might be th something as simple as you've got good organisational skills, you have some broadcasting skills so you know how to do an interview. Um, you also have the contacts that you need to make the story. And that's a, a really important one for our judging panel. Um, in particular, if you're doing a story on a specific or involving or with a specific group of people, we really need to know that you have access to that to those people and that you're going to be able to, I guess, um, do the interviews uh, so that you have an in, essentially, um, to the story that you're going to do. So have a little bit of a think about that before you put your pitch in. Um, even do a little bit of what we might call um, pre-story research. So putting a few feelers out and saying, hey, I'm really interested in doing a story about this. Would that be something that you guys would be interested in talking about? So that you actually start to make that initial contact. That way, when you actually put your application in, you can say, uh, I've had contact with this group before. Um, I uh, am confident that I will be able to get an interview fro from them for the story. Those sorts of things. The other, so you're selling the idea, and you, you want to back that up with your experience and skills. So let us know a little bit about what you've done in the past as well. So perhaps you do a program on community radio every week uh, where you do interviews. Let us know that, that that's, what you're, that's what you've done. Maybe you've made some sponsorship announcements in the past or you've made other little packages. So just letting us know what kind of experience and skills you already have um, is really good for us. Of course, this is like um, you know a skilling up thing, so it's not necessarily um, going to exclude you if you haven't had um, any audio editing skills and, and things like that before. 
Um, the other thing about a pitch document and uh, the application is that it's a chance for you to think through your idea, develop it a little bit more deeply and start to think about problems and barriers because that's going to um, save you a lot of time in the long run if you've if you've thought through any barriers or issues that might come up and how you would overcome them and how you deal with them. An executive producer is looking for that insight from you about whether you've thought this through fully and actually planned it out. So talking a little bit about your pitch, there's a couple of elements. Um, so these are things that you should start, you should just think through. And you don't have to, I'll send through this PowerPoint to everyone to help you with a little bit of a checklist. So just, um, just have a look at it for now. So a couple of questions to ask yourself is what is the story idea and why would it make a good radio program? Who are you thinking would be interested in hearing about this? So thinking of an intended audience, we've talked about the idea of a national suitability for a national audience, but that doesn't mean you can't sort of narrow that down a little bit as well. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be super general. I mean, obviously Sarah is there, hers is about GMOs, um, genetically modified organisms that is, and, you know, there's obviously a group of people, particularly, um, in our kind of listenership who are very interested in that sort of stuff, environmental issues, health issues and all that sort of thing. So it's really, you know, kind of suitable piece that has appeal to the audience of community radio. Uh, the other thing to think about is whose voices will be heard throughout the program that you make through the, the feature and documentary that you make um, and why are we going to hear those voices? So you want to think through that. The other important part, and we will ask you this, is what role will you play in the program? We're moving into storytelling and very much away from straight news and current affairs and straight question and answer interviews. You can actually become part of the story in this. And when we look at an example in the moment, um, we'll look at the way that one of the producers from last year really became part of the story. So they, you, you can be a narrator or you might choose to sort of take a step back and have your characters in the story narrate it and tell the story themselves. We've got a few different kind of examples of, of the way that um, people have put themselves in or haven't put themselves in in the examples from last year so I'd really encourage you to, to have a listen to those. Think about what other types of sound you'd use, really brainstorm, do a mind map about all the different music sound effects and, and location recordings. One's really great there where he talked about the difficulties he had of recording in a laboratory. Um, but the laboratory sound effects were fantastic. It might have been the case though that he, he might have been better to do his interviews in a nice quiet spot and then go off and record the sounds of the laboratory so he had a sound bed to use later. Think about what costs we will be involved in you producing your piece. Do you have to travel somewhere to get an interview? Do you need to buy some equipment because you can't access it at the station uh, that you're volunteering at? Those sorts of things. Or do you need to, you know, lend or borrow bits and pieces? So make sure you think about what costs will be involved and um, kind of think about your capacity to do that and think about because it's a paid piece, there, there is a certain amount of money that you could actually invest into it. Um, what experience do you have in radio production and, and Andrew kind of covered that as well in talking through the application where you actually get to specify the experience that you have. So thinking about those things when before you're writing a pitch is a really good checklist to go through. Um, so when it comes to actually writing your pitch and this is writing into the, into the application what your idea is, I want you to do it like you're telling a story. It isn't um, a list and it isn't a, uh, a sort of like, yeah, I'm going to do this. It's you're telling the story of the story, essentially. You want to take the person who's listening to, who's reading it, sorry, on a journey. You want a nice, clear, logical structure in that pitch as well and you want to hook them in and explain why the story is important. So the pitch is like, you know, important in that way. You want to give the person reading it, a real idea of how it's going to sound and then of course as we said before, sell yourself and what your skills are as well and what your contacts and connection to the story is because if you have a good connection to the story, the executive producers and that, that judging panel is going to have a little bit more confidence that you're going to be able to pull that story off and actually make it, um, make it happen. So in here there's um, questions that the pitch form, 
essentially the application form asks you and um, they are based around what makes the story interesting, who your main characters are. That's one that often trips people up. They might not specify who the characters are. We're looking for names in that instance. We're looking up for actual people. So that's where, you, where your, um, your pre-story kind of story research comes into play. It's not that useful for the executive producers and the judging panel if you just say something like, I'm going to talk to an expert in blah, blah, blah find the expert, expert that you're going to talk to and, and put their name into the application so that we have a really good idea of who the characters of your story are actually going to be and who you will interview. Give us a bit of an idea of other sources of information you will use. Perhaps you have some good contacts, perhaps you, perhaps you have an area of study that you've done before or you are doing a program that's in some way related so you have some really great source material that you've used in the past. So give us an idea of what source, um, what sources you're going to use. And of course really important in this one, how will you use sound to tell the story? Um, so using sound as Andrew said, it can be really creative or it might be minimal and in the example that we're going to look at in a moment you'll see just how minimal it can get but sound is incredibly important to this. We're, we're wanting you to really think in the terms of, of sound and how the oral landscape of your story um, sort of plays out. Okay, so um, before we go to questions, I thought um, I'll just run you through a sample pitch. Um, this is Michael Schubert. He was the winner from last year for his piece In Search of Silence. And um, his piece was really beautiful in the end um, and one that he's been able to sort of take and expand and he, he's had it up on a few different um, sort of platforms now and I think it's had over 6,000 listens so he's pretty pretty amazing reach that he's, he's had with this piece. So when he was pitching his story, this is what he wrote and I think it's quite beautiful because it asks some questions, it piques some interest in um, the person who's reading it and it also poses a really interesting kind of um, problem that he wants to solve. So silence is elusive and the sound of silence is worth exploring. Tripping away the noise, wanted and unwanted until there is nothing left. He's hooked me in from that kind of first line. When was the first time or the last time you experienced silence? Why is it so aloof, elusive and what is the nature and value of silence? Who is interested in silence and why? So he's posed a lot of questions in the kind of start of his pitch. And I'm reading that and I'm thinking, hmm, interesting topic. How's he going to answer these? I, I kind of want to know, um, you know, how he's going to answer some of these questions. Don't get too question heavy in your pitch, <laughs> um, but tell a story that way. It is one way of hooking, hooking people in. So then he went on to tell us why he thinks the story is interesting and I think this one was quite appealing because it really did appeal to the idea of us being broadcasters. So the people reading it had a frame of reference really. Um, it, it, he said it defies the common sense of broadcasting where dead air is to be avoided. So trying to do something about silence on radio is a difficult, interesting sort of challenge and we kind of were really intrigued by that. We thought, okay, how would you do this? What would this sound like in the end? So he hooked us in with that. And then he gave us some interesting stuff around um, this idea that there's composers that value silence more than sound. He brought in this, this, this place, and, and I can never say it, Noyak Chamber. Um, and Anechoic. Anechoic, thanks Andrew, I knew you were going to jump in there. Anechoic chamber, <laughs> <No. laughs> which I'd never heard of before and um, you know it was really interesting because he put this little factoid in there that people couldn't tolerate it for more than 45 minutes because their body becomes a source of sound. Immediately I was like, whoa, I've never heard of that, that's so interesting. So there's another little bit of a hook in there of what makes this story interesting and essentially I'm already going, okay, he's thought this through, uh, he's thought about some, some kind of elements that he's going to bring into this story. 
he went a little bit further then and he actually uh, talked a little bit about some of the characters and sources that he would use. So he, link, he actually listed a few people and the photographs down there on the bottom are actually two of the people that he ended up interviewing. Um, and uh, there was a composer and there was also a sound designer as well. So he had, he had kind of a lot of um, ideas there and then was able to narrow that down into actual characters in the story. And he, his kind of, um, sorry, range of people that he spoke to was really interesting as well. I think if you go and listen to the piece, you, piece, you kind of go on this um, interesting journey of how different people who use sound on a daily basis or who work with sound on a, different, on a daily basis approach silence and are interested in the way silence affects them. He also noted here that he um, does a radio show and he has access to people from academic backgrounds and institutions and the personnel. So we were confident that he would be able to reach the people that he needed to reach. Okay, and then this is where things kind of got a little bit more interesting, um, where we asked about how we'd use sound to tell the story. And he said the narrative will be embedded in a soundscape. So we knew he was going to use that. He was going to have a sound installation with the narrative woven throughout it. He was really interested in the idea that there would be opportunities for reflection. And if you listen to that, there is actually quite a lot of, of that throughout his piece. He poses questions, he has some interesting, um, I guess, sound design with voices, so it actually kind of gets you thinking. Um, and will hopefully create a questioning about the value of silence. There is a lot of questions being asked in the soundscape of his piece. So that's quite interesting. He's given us an example of a storytelling style that he's used before, um, so that we can kind of have a bit of an idea of um, of what his experience is there and what kind of sound he'd like to create. And he also wants to extend himself, which is sort of what, he've ta what he's talked about at the end there. So he was really interested in extending his creative ability with sound. Um, so we were interested in, in how he would do that. And this was one where when it actually got, um, it got approved, we, we um, paired him up with a mentor that uh, we thought would, and also gave him um, some contacts that he thought he could talk, we could talk to him, talk to him a little bit more in depth about how he might approach this idea of um, talking about sound, silence with sound. So um, it was something we were really interested in actually someone exploring. So I guess that's what really kind of hooked us into that story. Um, Okay, so that's sort of like the the basics, I guess, of what it, what um, we're looking for in terms of your pitch and things for you to think about in terms of putting that pitch together and putting your application together. Um, Andrew, when are the applications due? Uh, yeah. Okay, you can hear me now. Uh, the applications are due. At uh, 11.59 p.m. on Sunday the 9th of April. Sunday the 9th of April. All right, so you've got about a month, really, to, um, to prepare your pitch and put it together. Uh, we're going to send you a couple of things. We'll send you, um, Ira Glass has got this great video series. If you haven't watched it already, I'll send you the link to that um, on storytelling. So that kind of gets you into the mode where you, um, where you start to kind of break away from perhaps the traditional stuff that you've been doing in your community radio to shifting your thinking into the storytelling mode a bit. And we will bang on about storytelling throughout the whole process. Um, so it's imp I guess it's good for you to kind of get a bit of an idea of, of what we mean when we're talking about storytelling in audio. We'll give you uh, an ebook. We're going to send you an ebook which basically covers the things that I've spoken about briefly today. Um, quick guide to pitching a story. And we'll also send you some sample pitches so you can kind of see what people did in the past. And hopefully that helps you um, put your pitch together. Just before we go, I'm going to quickly go to questions. I'll just go quickly back to that um, the application form and bring it up on the screen for you. Excellent. I've also, uh, in the first message in the instant message box, is a link to the application form, if you're a fan. You of might want to send it again, Dan, uh, Danny, because only people who've 
who came in when you sent, who were in the room when you sent that, will see it. Excellent. All right, I'll do that right away. Yeah. So just send it again now. Um, so uh, that's the the um, form there. You can get to it via the CBAA website as well. I'm sure. Um, I'll just point out the, the sections that I am talking about. So description of proposed documentary feature, that's where you put your hook, the bit that's going to get me interested straight away in, in the documentary. So, you know, um, Michael started his bit with a little bit of a prose even, you could say, which was really beautiful to read. Um, so something along those lines. And then we get into a little bit more de detail of what makes the story interesting. And then you can really outline the main characters of your story, who you're going to interview, the sources of information you'll use, and how you'll use sound to tell the story. So basically those things that I went through uh, spelled out there. So I recommend you kind of writing it up yourself, um, maybe on a, um, on a Word document or something like that, having a little bit of a look at it, doing a draft, and then popping it into the application form. The other thing we're quite happy is that if you're really, uh, really unsure about whether your story is, is suitable, send an email through to um, myself and, and Andrew, I'm nominating you for this, but you can say no, um, and we will, yeah, we will we'll let you know or we'll give you some encouragement one way or the other. <laughs> Um, ab about it. So, um, and if you have any questions about whether you think it, it's going to work, um, we can kind of help you out at that point. So, get those questions to us well before the the, um, the application is due, if you don't mind. Okay, um, I think that's it from me. Um, should we go to some questions, Danny? Now, if you're asking for questions from the audience, um, you have very much sort of gone about answering those in the instant message box, which is fantastic. Uh, Cynthia Keith, g'day Cynthia, how are you going? Uh, thank you so much for your attendance and all the hard work you do on behalf of the community broadcasting sector. On the suitability of national broadcast for ethnic language pieces, um, yes, ethnic language pieces are accepted and there has been a practice in past to, in the past to translate those into English for English audiences. And this is a great use of creative audio. Um, obviously, that is uh, the uh, more finer details of that are ones that can be discussed. But yes, we will accept pieces that are not in English as well we should. Uh, Cynthia also asked questions about the travel and accommodation to Sydney for the weekend, um, where you sort of get together and all discuss your pieces. And that is covered by the CBAA. I should get along to that one. <laughs> Deadly silence. You're not invited. Yeah. Oh, well, fair enough then. Um, uh, so the date for the Sydney workshop has not been finalised. It will be in June and a fixed date is coming soon. Beth Gibson asked about the national community radio suitability uh, in regards to stories on sensitive topics such as domestic violence. Uh, Andrew responded, with all stories with content or topics that require sensitivity are eligible in your application, we ask that you demonstrate an understanding of the ethical engagement with the topic and what steps you will take from there with reference to resources that advise on best practice when it comes to reporting on these topics. Um, I, and I, should, I should just say I, I, I didn't mean to uh, ask for uh, something somewhere over the top as a response, uh, like a, a breakdown of the ethical barriers and how they're going to be engaged. <laughs> but of course, if you're, if you're dealing with such a topic, uh, we just need to see uh, that demonstration that you are aware of. Uh, what you're engaging with and that you might be dealing, uh, you might be interviewing people with uh, significant experiences and uh, just an awareness that there are resources that uh, you should be looking at when you engage these topics around uh, ethical reporting on such matters. Excellent. Uh, Beth also asked another question in regards to the copyright aspect of the piece um, as to whether it can be spread wider than just use via the sort of official national features and documentary series. It can indeed. Um, yes. But yes. So ownership remains with uh, yourself as the participant and your home station. So uh, if there's agreements between you and your home station, you're kind of bound by those outside of the right of the CBAA and the community radio network to broadcast and host this material. 
Excellent. And I might just add to that that um, when you do uh, get accepted into the series and the mentorship, you you will actually have a contract that sort of outlines all of the copyright stuff as well. Ah, fantastic. I, I actually think that's really important stuff uh, in regards to sort of the, the copyright aspects of everything. Um, I would also assume that that means don't go using music or anything else that's covered by copyright in your piece. We will actually cover that in the mentorship and in the training. So if people have further questions around that and, and um, have concerns around copyright in terms of what they're using in it, we'll have plenty of time to discuss that. That's why I didn't get in last year when I entered Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. That's my <laughs> entry. It was deemed that that was not actually my work. I can't believe it. Yeah, I missed out on a free weekend in Sydney, courtesy of the CBAA. <laughs> and there was some questions there from Cynthia also in regards to uh, just sort of the concrete aspects of the process. Now, would I be correct in assuming that this form is one, can you say, can you sort of get halfway through, save it and come back? and do it, or you've got to do it all in one job lot, guys? Unfortunately, it's a one job lot, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, actually, to confirm, it is. Um, so uh, I, I ask that uh, you've prepared your answers ahead of time, especially the big answers, and uh, maybe in another text file, and you can uh, copy and paste those in as you fill out uh, all the other just uh, practical details, such as your name and station. Yeah, I love the copy and paste. I think it's super stuff. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. Just a bit of housekeeping. I would like to uh, let everyone know that our next couple of webinars, 29th of March and 24th of April, creating cash reserves and entering the CBAA awards respectively. It would be great to have you guys there available. I also noticed that there's a couple of people there in our attendees tonight who are waiting emails from me. I'm talking uh, Dorothy and Lance. Um, sorry, guys, I'll get on to those ones as soon as I can. And um, um, the feedback for this evening's webinar will be sent to you guys in the form of an email and won't just sort of generate automatically at the end of the session due to a clerical error on my behalf. I just, I just wanted to um, answer one question that came up, um, Danny, that I don't think we covered, and that was um, Andrea asked, can you pitch more than one idea? Huh. And you, def you definitely can. Um, that's no problem at all and um, put in you know as many as you want <laughs> um, but the other thing I wanted to mention was that you can pitch as a group as well so um, if you have a couple of you that are um, interested in working together on something um, we've had in our first year we had a group of um, three and in the second year I think we had a group of two um, so feel free to put something together as a group of course the final fee uh, remains the same and is, is divided between the group, the payment, um, but you know working as a group can sometimes make it a little bit easier and, um, and you know you, you can um, share the load. Excellent. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. I think we're going to finish on time here this evening. Thank you so much to Andrew from the CRN and Geordie from the CMTO. You'll be hearing more from those guys in regards uh, to contributing to the National Features and Documentary Series. Um, I hope that everyone Can't had wait a... to see everyone's pictures. And on a separate note, happy International Women's Day to everyone. Um, hopefully you might have seen on the CBAA's social media the call out. If you were doing anything special at your station for IWD, please let us know about that because we would love to report on that retroactively and just let people know there's a lot of stations doing some great stuff today in regards to celebrating the day. I uh, can't remember what station we had it tuned into today, but they played nothing but music by the ladies. I'm talking contemporary hits such as uh, Jet Fuel Won't Melt Steel Beams by Camp Cove, all the way to classics like Pretend We're Dead by L7. I was loving it. Oh, I love that song. I love that song. Which one? <laughs> Both of them? Pretend that, pretend that we're dead. Oh, man, that is just... I also love Camp Cove. Stone. Yeah, well, Camp Cove is great. <laughs> but we wouldn't even have a Camp Cove if it wasn't for L7. Exactly. All right, that's enough from me, I reckon. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, we love you a long time, and we will see you at our next webinar. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Jody. Thank you. Thank you.